Grazie. Thanks, Pastor Andrew. We go back, so far back, I knew him when he had hair. <laughs> long time ago, long, long, long. Uh, what a joy it is to be here with you all. Uh, I am uh, uh, somewhat sad to say, uh, I've got to rush out right when I'm done preaching because my kid is in a championship game playing this afternoon in Oakland and uh, I need to try to catch him. So hopefully you all understand that. I can't believe you've got the clock on me. It's the last service. What, what's the deal with the clock? Do, do we really need the clock? Can I just preach until Jesus comes? Is that... Uh, uh, not everybody's clapping on that. I like that. You keep it real. No, you cannot preach that long. <laughs> If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Hosea chapter 3. It's been my joy to kick off this series called Trending. As you're making your way to Hosea chapter 3, we've done three different messages. Um, uh, Andrew asked me to come in and do three different ones because he's toying with that idea uh, himself of doing three different messages every Sunday for the rest of his ministry. Is that right, uh, Pastor Andrew? <laughs> no, uh, but no, we, we began this morning by talking about patience in the first service, second service. Service, we talked about trending into manhood and this third service I, I want to talk uh, with you about about love Hosea chapter 3 let's say a word of prayer and then let's dive into it father thanks for this great church thanks for all that you're doing through the bridge church here in this section of your vineyard called Fresno thanks for the lives that are being transformed and changed and I just pray a simple prayer begging you to not stop uh, God, continue to save souls, continue to change lives, continue to strengthen people, we pray. I pray, Lord God, that you'd use me in the next few moments that we have together to add another brick to what you're building here in this church. Use me, Father, as I scatter the seed of your word. May it fall on good ground. May it take root and produce great fruit. Change lives, save souls, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A young man sat down to have a conversation with an elderly woman. Not long into the conversation, this young man noticed that situated on the coffee table between them was a dish that appeared to be filled with the most delightful, delectable peanuts he'd ever seen in his life. I mean, these peanuts looked off the chain. He was distracted by these peanuts as this elderly woman is bearing her soul and sharing her heart. Finally, this young man could take it no longer and he, he interrupted this elderly woman. He says, ma'am, I'm, I'm so sorry. I know you've been sharing your heart, uh, but I'm so sorry, ma'am. Uh, for the last few moments, I've been distracted by these peanuts. I gotta tell you, these peanuts look off the chain. Ma'am, would you mind if I had some? This woman was clearly thrown by this request. She paused for a few moments. During that awkward pause, this young man was thinking to himself, this is weird. It seems to be a pretty innocuous request. I'm just asking for some peanuts. What's up with all the silent pause drama going on right now? Finally, this woman acquiesced and says, yes, young man, you can have some of these peanuts. The conversation reconvenes. This elderly woman uh, goes back to sharing her heart as this young man is listening patiently and popping these peanuts into his mouth. Finally, a few moments later, much to his horror, he looks down and the dish is empty. Cannot believe this. For the second time, he cuts off this elderly woman and he says, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I, I grew up down south and my mama raised me better than this. Here I am, ma'am, a guest in your house, and I done ate up all your peanuts. But I got to tell you, ma'am, they were as good as they looked. These peanuts were off the chain. In fact, ma'am, these peanuts look so good and they taste so good. I, I got to ask you, ma'am, where in the world did you get them from? Because I've got to have them for myself. Now this elderly woman is clearly embarrassed. She turns a bright shade of red. She pauses for what feels like an eternity when in reality it is no longer than about 10 or 15 seconds. Again, this young man is going, what's going on? He's thinking to himself, this seems to be again a harmless 
request. Finally, this woman gathers herself together and she says, young man, as you can see, I'm an elderly woman. And as such, I don't know if you've noticed by now, I have no teeth. These peanuts used to be covered in chocolate. But because I have no teeth, I just suck the chocolate off and spit them back into the dish. You all ready for lunch? The moral of the story is things are not always as they appear. And what's true of once chocolate covered peanuts, I fear, is true of so many people who think they're saved but are not. So many people are operating under the illusion of salvation, when in reality they are not saved. It was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, that great mid-20th century London preacher, who once said Matthew chapter 7 is the scariest chapter in all the Bible. It is not for the faint of heart. Here is Jesus reaching the crescendo of his great Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 7, he envisions a conversation that he has with a group of religious leaders in which he tells them, I'm sorry, but I cannot let you into the kingdom. Shocked, these religious leaders say to him, but wait a minute, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And Jesus says to them in so many words, thanks but no thanks, depart from me, I never knew you. These are some of the most shocking words in all of scripture. Because in it, Jesus reveals that hell will have many parking spaces reserved for church attending people. For people who may have even graduated from seminaries. People who served in ministry, sang on praise teams, played in worship bands, were here faithfully Sunday in and Sunday out. But Jesus shows us that just because you hang out in the same environment as other Christians, no more makes you a Christian than me standing in my garage makes me a car. It's not about your environments. It's not about the size of your Bible. It's not the reality that you're on the longest consecutive quiet time streak of your life. These things in and of themselves do not authenticate your Christianity. Well, how do I know that I'm saved? Later on in Matthew 7, Jesus says, here's how you know. You shall recognize them by their fruit. I love it. Fruit is a changed and changing lifestyle that cannot be blamed on the normal maturation process of adulthood, but can only be blamed on the filling of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer. In other words, every Christian should be able to look through the rearview mirror of their journey with Jesus and conclude two things. One, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I still make mistakes. I still sin. I still think, think things I shouldn't. I still say things I shouldn't. I, I still do things I shouldn't. I, I have not arrived. In fact, I, I grew up in a little chocolate church in Atlanta, and we used to sing a song that simply said, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I have not arrived. But secondly, every legitimate Christian should be able to say that while I haven't arrived, when I look through the rearview mirror, I can also say I am not all the way where I once was. He is changing me. My pastor, Bishop Kenneth Ulmer, he said this in front of 13,000 people one Sunday at his church, so I don't mind saying it in front of you all. He said, you know, when I first got saved, he said, when I first came to Jesus, I used to cuss at the drop of a hat. But now since following Christ, he said, I don't cuss that fast anymore. <laughs> I'm not condoning cursing. If that upsets you, please email me at Andrew Smith at the Bridge Church. <laughs> He's not condone condoning profanity. What is he saying? 
he's acknowledging, on the one hand, I haven't arrived. You cut me off on the freeway, and I haven't had my time with the Lord. I, I might want to pull up next to you and speak to you in sign language. <laughs> but on the other hand, he's saying, I, I'm not where I used to be. He's changing me. Anybody in the house can look through the rearview mirror and say, I'm not where I should be, but I'm not where I once was. He's, oh, I'm hearing some amens. Y'all gonna make this chocolate preacher feel at home in here. <laughs> I'm not where I once was. You shall recognize them, Jesus says, not by their church, but you shall recognize them by their fruit. How does that happen? It happens, Ephesians 5 tells us, by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, I love it, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's writing in Greek, and the Greek word for filled is one of my favorite words. It is the Greek word pleroma. It means to be filled to overflowing. I love it. It was, it was this word that was actually used of pregnant women, and not just any old pregnant woman, but a woman in her third trimester of pregnancy. I'm talking show enough pregnant. I'm talking can't bend down to tie your shoes pregnant. I'm talking so overflowing with baby that even though you just met her for the first time, step to her in courageous confidence and ask her when the babies do pregnant. Because there's no doubt. That's the word Paul uses to be filled with the spirit. It's as if he's saying, I, I want you to be third trimestered with the Spirit of God. So overflowing with the Holy Spirit that even though someone may have just met you for the first time, they may not even have all the right theological terminology. They, they, they know that there's just something different about you. And what's different is you're under different management. You're not calling the shots in your life. Someone else is. And it's the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Please notice that the leadoff batter to the list is love. You shall recognize them by their fruit. That fruit is brought on by the surrendered life to the Holy Spirit. And I know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit because I'm marked by love. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul would say it this way, Now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. John 13, Jesus would say it this way, By this will all men know that you're my disciples by the arguments you have on Facebook. <laughs> no, by this will all people know that you're the real deal followers of Jesus. Jesus says, by your love for one another. It was the great homiletics professor, preaching professor, Dr. Robert Smith Jr. of Beeson Divinity, who said these words, every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. Every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. If the penultimate New Testament passage that makes the point on love is 1 Corinthians 13, now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, then if you want a picture of what love really looks like, come to Hosea 3. Hosea 3 is the penultimate picture of love. If you want to know what it looks like to to love your children the way God would have you to love your children. If you want to know what it looks like to love that, that roommate who gets on your last nerve by drinking up all your stuff and wearing your clothes. If you want to look like, know what it looks like to love your spouse well or to love a friend well or to love enemies well. Hosea 3 is the penultimate Old Testament picture. I want to read the whole chapter to you. Chill out, it's just five verses. <laughs> Hosea writes, 
And the Lord said to me, go again, love, love, love a woman who is loved by another man and is, not used to be, is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Uh, underline verse 2, so I bought her, watch the detail, for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. After the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Amen. God comes to Hosea and he says, Hosea, I got a problem, a huge one. My problem, Hosea, is I have entered into marriage with my people Israel. But my bride Israel keeps on cheating on me. God's words, by whoring after other gods. FYI, you do know every time we sin, we commit spiritual adultery. We, we cheat on God. God says, here's my problem. My problem is not so much that Israel has cheated on me. My problem is, is that she has given me the right to divorce her but in my holiness, I can't divorce her. So my problem, Hosea, is, is that I am married to a serial philanderer. And I refuse to divorce. Hosea, I, I'm, I'm wanting to show Israel how deeply I love her. I want her to know that, that my relationship with her is not transactional. I want her to know that this relationship is not a contract, it is a covenant. You know the difference, don't you? Contracts are performance oriented. Some of you signed a contract at your job and the basic nuts and bolts behind it is you, you meet these standards over here, you'll, you'll get these blessings over here, you fail to perform over here, you will get these consequences over here. Praise God that our relationship with God is not based on a contract. This is not performance oriented. It is not a 50-50 proposition in which God says, I'll meet you halfway. He doesn't say that, by the way. Anyone who ever says, I'll meet you halfway is typically a poor judge of distance. <laughs> no, our relationship with God is not quid pro quo. It's not transactional. It's a covenant. So God says, I've married these people. They keep cheating on me, but I refuse to leave them. In fact, Hosea, I want to communicate to them that I am with them even beyond till death do us part. That there's nothing they could ever do to make me turn my back on them. I want to communicate that to them through you. I can see Hosea saying, okay, God, so what are you thinking? You want me to write a book? Oh, that'll come later. You want me to preach a sermon? Oh, that'll come later. Well, God, what do you want me to do? I can see God now. Jose, I, I see that you just graduated from seminary. Got called to your first church. You're a single senior pastor. I'm going to change that, Hosea. You're about to get married. I can see the excitement on Hosea's face. Can't you see it? He's rubbing his hands together. Go, okay, God, who is she? What's her name? Gomer. <laughs> now, no offense if your name's Gomer. That don't sound cute to me. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's your name. Email me at Andrew Smith at the Bridge Church. <laughs> but more strikingly, Hosea is like, well, what does she do, God? According to chapter 1, she's a prostitute. Huh. Oh, wait a minute, God. She's a prostitute. Yeah, that's right. In fact, Hosea, in the words of Rick James, this ain't the kind of girl you'll take home to mama. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm so glad y'all got that. I didn't know <laughs> if that was going to fly here. Uh, God didn't actually say that, but. 
wait a minute, God. Just see our first Sunday there at the, at the church. We're walking in, the preacher and the prostitute. God, that's a strange sight. And in so many words, God says that's exactly the point. Remember, Hosea, your marriage to Gomer is not about your marriage to Gomer. It's an illustration of my marriage with my people. And if you think the preacher being with the prostitute is a strange sight, I can do you a stranger one. The fact that I, a holy God, am with you is an even stranger sight. What does it mean to love well? Love anything authentically and deep enough, it'll take you through periods of strangeness. In fact, if you never go to strange places in your love for someone, I would argue it's not genuinely love. Our family just moved to the Bay a little over two years ago, and my youngest uh, got picked up by this really good AAU team. And our first game, I'll never forget it, we were playing in San Francisco, and we sit down, and my, my, young, my, my youngest son is the two guard. He's the shooting guard. And, uh, and the point guard, point guard, he has two moms, two women who are married to one another. We sit down next to them. We get to know them. We exchange numbers. The game ends. My wife and I get in our car. We make the long journey from San Francisco back to where we live in San Jose. On the way back, my wife and I kind of say to each other in, in similar ways, what if God is calling us not to change this lesbian couple? We can't change anybody. We can't even change ourselves. What if God's calling us to love them? So we start inviting them over. They start coming over the house, and it's a little strange. Sitting at the dinner table, holding hands, doing what married folk do. And it's awkward for me. I grew up down south, y'all. Strange. We're enjoying good food. We're hanging out all throughout fall season. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, please don't ask me what I do for a living. <laughs> you talk about a record scratching moment. <laughs> and sure enough, we make it through fall season and hanging out the whole time. And not once do they ask, but early on in the spring season, they're over the house and one of them says, hey, Brian, we've been hanging out for a while. We, we just want to know, what do you do for a living? I said, I tell people how to find true meaning, value, fulfillment in life through God's only son, Jesus Christ. I am a pastor. One of them immediately got up from the table, grabbed her purse, and said, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> she headed for the door, seriously. And I'm thinking to myself, and y'all call us judgmental? I didn't say that because as a pastor, you can't say everything you're thinking. <laughs> I cracked a joke, got her to come back to the table. We finished up the evening. We hang out some more. And a couple of months later, I get a call from one of them. She said, hey, Brian, uh, we just want you to know we've enjoyed hanging out with you. And even though we're as different as different can be, you know, you're into this religious stuff. We call ourselves atheists. You're in a heterosexual relationship. We, we're a lesbian married couple. She said, I just want you to know that our son is getting to the age where we feel like he's, he's in need of a positive male role model. So we just sold our house and we bought a house around the corner from yours because we think you're the one who needs to pour into our son's life. No pressure. <laughs> then she says, oh, and I keep hearing about this house blessing thing. Could you come over and bless our house? I said, as in talk to God over your house? Yes, do that. 
my wife and I go over a couple weeks later. We walk into the place, and from the looks of things, my wife and I were the only heterosexual couple in a house that was jam-packed. It was strange. The whole time there, woman is that we'd never met is taking our pictures, snapping our pictures, snapping our pictures, snapping our pictures. Next day, I'm at the office, and my wife sends me a text. Honey, they done tagged us on Facebook. <laughs> a couple hours later, I get a phone call from one of the dear sweet mothers in our church, 80-something years old. And this dear, sweet octogenarian calls me. First words out of her mouth, Pastor, I was on Facebook. <laughs> her words, not mine. Is my pastor partying with homosexuals? Because the Jesus I know, she said, wouldn't hang out with homosexuals. Now, there's a verse in the Bible I don't like. If there was one verse in the Bible I could cut out, it'd be this one. It's a verse that says, do not rebuke an older person. <laughs> I don't like that verse. I know it's not true here, but I know some older people who need to be rebuked. <laughs> Calmly, I said to her, Mother, I'd encourage you to read up on Jesus some more. Because the Jesus I know hung out with some strange people in some strange places. How strange are your relationships? Footnote. Spring season's winding up last year and after one of our games, my wife and I come up to the point guards, two moms, and says, look, my, my wife and I have been, been talking, crazy idea. We're about to go on vacation. We're going to go to New York for a week and then down to a Christian camp just outside of Atlanta for a week. We'd love to take your son. We'll pay for everything. We know that's a crazy, insane, big ass to take your son thousands of miles away. But so y'all talk about it. Get back to, again, we'll take care of everything. They said, we don't even need to think about it. You can take him. So we take him. Hangs out, New York, go to the Christian camp, hang out. Last night of camp, he comes up to me and says, Mr. Loritz, can you show me how to become a follower of Jesus? <laughs> what got that boy on the plane was love. What got him an audience to even hear the gospel was love. May we not be known by our position papers, but by our love. So he gets back, and I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be a doozy of a conversation. <laughs> and one of the moms calls up and says, I don't know what happened on that trip. But since our son's been back, he's been, he's been carrying around a big old Bible telling us we need to go to church. She says, Brian, actually, we're open to it. But I got a question, she says. Is your church a safe place for us? Because the other churches I've been to in my life have hurt us. I says, yes, you'll come. When you come, you'll sit on the front row with me and my wife. The problem with the body of Christ is we have allowed Fox News and CNN and MSNBC to disciple us more than Jesus. Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity and Chris Cuomo and let me get them all right, Rachel Maddow, did I cover all the bases, are louder voices to us than Jesus Christ. There won't be Fox News in heaven. There won't be CNN in heaven. There won't be MSNBC in heaven. Need I remind us, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. The 
problem with the body of Christ is we've gotten far too tribal to love in the way of Jesus is to love people who don't look like, act like, think like, vote like, or make the same sexual choices you make. Ooh, I've got four minutes and 48, 47, 46 seconds <laughs> in the last service. Something happened. We know it happened. Gomer cheats on Hosea. The opening verses of our text, God tells him in verse 1, go again, go get her. Verse 2, Hosea says, so I bought her, watch it now, for 15 shekels and a homer and a lethic of barley. I wish I had more time to explain this, but I don't. Here's what I want you to understand. In modern parlance, Gomer has gotten herself in trouble and is being sex trafficked. She's in bondage. The average cost that it took in Hosea's day to redeem a woman who was being sex trafficked was 30 shekels. So why doesn't it say, so I bought her for 30 shekels? Why the detail? Why does it say I bought her for 15 shekels and a homer and a lethic of barley? Answer, he didn't have 30 shekels. For him to emancipate the one who cheated on him cost him everything he had. He literally goes to the auction block with nothing. Second thing I want you to see about love real quickly. If it doesn't cost, it ain't love. If you're not paying a price, I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. Brother, you're going to be playing that piano for a while. Give me a few more minutes. <laughs> if you ain't paying a price, no, 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 I wasn't joking. If you <laughs> ain't paying a price, it ain't love. But isn't that our problem? We want Nordstrom quality community at thrift store prices. You don't want to be inconvenienced. Some of you all have literally said, I, I just can't deal with anybody who's got drama. As if you don't have drama. I got drama, you got drama, all God's children got some drama. In fact, just let's have a Pentecostal moment. Would you just turn to your neighbor and say, you got drama? <laughs> some of y'all said that a little bit too emphatically. You've been dying to say that. The very nature of love says, I'm willing to be inconvenienced by you. I'm willing to pay the cost. I've been preaching this text all wrong. Yeah, the secondary application is our relationship with one another, but the primary application is God's relationship with us. See, we will never love each other well until we first see ourselves as Gomer. We're Gomer. We're the strange ones who have violated God. And what does God do on the cross? He pays his homer and lethic of barley and his 15 shekels. Jesus gives everything that he has to emancipate and to set us free. And we will never love in the way of Jesus until we first see ourselves as the harlot. Okay, come on, Academy Award guy, come on. <laughs> the people who have the most difficulty loving are the self-righteous people who got too much arrogance to think they're not in need, but 
But until you come to the point where you say, I am the needy one. I am the one filled with drama. I was headed to an eternity in hell. And what did God do? At infinite cost to himself, he gave all that he had, his only son. Listen, I got three sons and Pastor Andrew has three sons and we love you all, but I ain't given one of my three for you. But God loved you so much that he gave his only son and his son loves you so much that he gave his only life. This is love. And to love in the way of Jesus is to fundamentally say, I am not put off on the, uh, on the differences. I'm not put off on the strangeness. I'm coming into this thing loving you as is because the good news of the gospel is that God sees us as is, accepts us as is, loves us as is, saves us as is, and yet by his grace never leaves us as is. I'm not called to change anybody. That's God's business. I'm called to love you. I'm called to walk with you. And at times to love means I tell you stuff you don't like. I had to have a hard conversation with this lesbian couple. They, they asked me to do their five-year vow renewal. I said, am I allowed to have a different opinion without being called a bigot? Or are we going to subscribe to the new tolerance, which is a low ethic? I tolerate you. Praise God, God doesn't tolerate me. He loves me. To love means I see it differently. I call it out, but I don't leave the table. So I said, I can't do the vow renewal, but you better be here next Saturday for the barbecue. That's love. That's love. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I bless your name in this place. I, I, I pray for the Bridge Church. There's so much more I wanted to say here, but I bless your name for this church. I thank you for Pastor Andrew. I thank you, Father God, for the gifts that you've given him and the heart that he has for this people. I thank you, Lord God, for coming up on 70 years of faithful gospel ministry that this church has been engaged in. I pray for all the lives that have been changed here, for all the sermons that have been preached here, all the notes that have been taken, all the learning that has happened. But I pray above all else that the reputation of the Bridge Church would be, oh, oh, that's the people who love. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, that's not the people who judge. That's the people who love. That, that's the people not who tolerate. That's the people who love, who who will speak truth, but even in speaking truth, it's gift wrapped in love. So Father, teach us what that means. I pray that our dinner tables would be strange gatherings. People, Lord God, from all walks of life. I, I, I pray that this would be a church of rich and poor, of Hispanic, white, Asian, black, and so many other things. I pray that it's not just diverse, but California diverse. California got stuff I ain't never heard of before, Lord God. I, I pray all of that makes its way up into this church. I pray, Lord God, that the parking lot would be filled with Obama stickers and Make America Great Again stickers. Because we're not trying to clone each other into our own image. May it never be said that this is the Republican church or this is the Democrat church, but may it be said that this is the Jesus church and that we would astound the world by our love because that's how you love us. We bless your name in this place. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen and amen.